first of all, thank you to the organizers uh, for being here. It's great to be able to uh, be part of this uh, important uh, meeting here and discussions. Um, maybe what was not said about was that I'm also a farmer. And actually an organic farmer, so I know what I'm talking about, and also grew up on a farm. Sort of interesting and important, you know, when we try to uh, lecture and you know, tell people what they should be doing. So what um, I'm going to talk about, uh, sustainable agriculture and food systems, why? Sort of a bit, I'll come to that. Uh, what are our options? And um, what stands in the way uh, for the transformation? Because that's actually, we haven't talked about that very much. What is the roadblock here? What is the elephant in the room? We should be talking about how much more, and be sort of how, how we can do it. I'll go a bit quickly over certain items which have already been uh, discussed a few times. But I think that we, we had this push for more efficiency all the time. Okay, we need more food, it has to be cheaper, there's more people, so, so we got into sort of a, a, a spiral which eventually uh, is a downwards spiral more monocrops, I mean, just all these pictures show. And I think that uh, the field of corn there with the dark sky explains exactly you know, what the problem is, uh, the dark uh, future. So we have soil degradation, we have degraded huge amount of soils. On the DSDGs now, what do we do? Oh, we're gonna be neutral only in degradation? We should go all the way the other way. That's actually one element there in those SDG, which again, the compromise was on the lowest common denominator. We have lost a lot of biodiversity, uh, most of it, but we don't even know it, like insects. We, we know what, maybe 10, 20 percent of them? So we keep losing them, we don't know. We don't know what they could have been helping us. So just to say, you know, so we are destroying a lot of things in our environment, in particular biodiversity, and not only just like plants, but I think there's many other elements in there. Think about soil, soil organism. There are gazillions of them, and we have destroyed our soils. We sterilize them with our pesticides, with our herbicides, with our uh, fertilizer in particular. So we have, we have just wanton destruction of our soils when we know that the soils are the solution to our problems. And I think that's what we have to look at. And um, again, we use too much energy in agriculture, way too much, and that has the problem that we climate change. We create a lot of ill health with this type of agriculture, these commodities which you heard before. We don't should eat commodities, right? We eat food. We nourish ourselves. We don't feed ourselves. And that's why all this commodization is going to the wrong direction. Um, and as we heard, you know, the social aspect, hunger and poverty, which, which are still there. So I think we really uh, we need to think about, you know, what the alternatives. And again, such uh, environments, landscapes, what you're looking for. And you can see them, uh, you, you should see them in many places in any continent of the world. That's what we're looking for. And I think we should be thinking of. Now, what have we done? You know, I, I keep showing this. Many of you may have seen it. But the fact is that today we grow twice as much food as we need. This is the thing which doesn't sink, not even in FAO, never mind at the Monsantos, in the governments who keep telling us that we need to intensify, that we need more food for the 10 billion people down the road. We already have enough today. And what I keep saying also is that Europe and America have zero business of feeding the world. Let nourish your own people first. In Europe, there are 40 million people who don't eat enough. In America, exactly the same. So why do we want to produce more here and export, as we heard before also, ruining the markets and the production capacity of other people? So I think we need to rethink. Less is better. So that's what I say. And if we have less, then we also have less to throw away. And maybe the price will go up, and then the farmers are happy too. But the system is totally corrupt the way it is, and it's been pushed continuously still in the wrong direction. And this picture we have seen many times before. So, again, we just saw it before. I just want to point to two e e effects. So one is the biodiversity one, which is way out of, of bound already, the red one on top, and also the nitrogen. That, that fertilizer, the dumbest invention after the plow was nitrogen, because we don't actually need any, because we know and we have the evidence for this that we can produce enough ourselves and that's what actually is true sustainability it's not going like many organic farmers do go buy in, in inputs no i think they got to be produced on farm and we can do that because we can produce less we, we have enough if we do less and i'll come to this in a minute 
Also, what I think we, we don't really grasp is the seriousness of the climate change issue. And we have an agriculture which is still being promoted under all kinds of names, we've seen before also, all kinds of names, everything goes. Climate smart, even agroecology, sustainable intensification, all actually going in the direction of still continuing to have an agriculture which actually contributes greenhouse gases, which in turn then actually uh, destroys it. So again, you know, you, you, this is really something you, um, which we have to be more aware and our policymakers. Now we know 350 ppm is the number. All right, we are all, almost 400. And there's no, 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 not, no sign out there that this will change. Or we'll see what they do on the 17th of November at, in Marrakesh, when it's Day of Agriculture, and when this goes to Katpur Mill. I don't know, we'll see. But uh, with Trump going probably there and saying he doesn't want to sign anything, we'll, we'll maybe uh, have a fat chance to go somewhere. So if you go back, you know, where we do we come from? So we had an agriculture, which is this nice agriculture, which is sort of green there. Uh, we were actually taking carbon down into the ground. Uh, sure, we are releasing some also. But that agriculture was working on the principles of ecosystem services. We were, we were getting pest management, pest control. We had nutrient cycling, water cycling. Um, we had pollination. And we had all those small, small farmers there, right? There are, Okay, so what happened? What happened? So in the name of agribusiness and the mercantile approach, we got rid of all this because you don't make any money with ecosystem services. So why don't we remove all this and start to sell fertilizer, start to sell uh, hybrid seeds or GMOs, uh, start to irrigate. Oh, with that stuff you can make money, plenty of money. And so that's what the problem is in our agriculture. We, we have gotten rid of what the nature is giving us. And in turn, we create a lot of CO2. And so that's the problem. But what I want to maybe give a bit of a spin on this talk here is the role of the eaters, of us, our role in doing this. Because when the farmers, what they do today, they do it because of the demand. It's not because they want to do certain things. Many farmers actually are pushed into doing this type of farming, which they do. Why? It's because people think food is a God-given right and it has to be cheap. Actually, it should be free. This is the problem we have out there. So again, so if we don't start to think about the consumer, the eaters, and obviously also the people who influence the eater. Because the pyramid to the right there, where we can see that we eat a lot of meat and dairy, I mean, that's, that has no future. And because of that, we have the system we have today. So we need to reverse this pyramid, as shown by Barilla, the group in Italy, the pasta group in Italy, which have a whole research institute of nutrition, and they have fantastic work that's been done there. And again, so we need to move from the one to the other. If we don't do this transition, we're not going to change the, the, the production system. No way, right? Okay, so if we change, then we can actually go all around. It is circular. Everything's connected out there. And so we go back to an agriculture which makes sense. But then the trends are actually quite different. Because when you go, okay, now we go to, to breeding. We're losing a lot of variety out there. Some people are trying to bring it back, fortunately. Because we know that the genetic makeup of a lot of the land races actually include a lot of the elements we, the farmer need to fight pests, for example. Plants are not dumb. They're not just sitting there and being eaten. They actually can react, or they used to. And we can measure this today. We measure this in an example I'll show you in a minute. So again, we need to actually work against those trends, which, again, now yeah, you simplify the system and make more money. Think about the maize worldwide. Oh, then we, div we diminish not only the genetic makeup, but also the number of varieties out there, or even what we grow. The maize craze, as I call it, is a total disaster on a global scale. Because maize is not even a good food, as we know. So, so what are we doing? In the sake of more money, that's what we're doing out there. So, no, uh, what's new? Nothing, because in 2008 or before, we had a report, 400 people, four year writing, and 2,000 pages. I should have brought that book also too, actually, a serious book. <laughs> you really load you up to go home. It's written there that agroecology a new paradigm is the way forward. Again, 
was fought left and right. Even uh, FAO didn't like it. Um, so it was it, the, the report was buried for the exception of NGOs. The NGOs all over the world keep, kept bringing it back, and it was resurrected in Rome, in, in uh, Rio Plus 20, in the in the uh, document, uh, the future we want, paragraph 111. You can go and read. It's a very long paragraph where basically has taken the essence of that report. And what happened next? That ended up in the SDGs. So if you look in the goal two and many of the other goals will link agriculture or food and health and water and environment, biodiversity, climate change, a lot was picked out of that report. So actually it lives, it continues in a totally different form and a form which we have now a framework for implementation. We don't have to go look for anything new now. Just implement SDGs and we go exactly where we need to go. In addition, as you probably know, I'm also a member of the uh, IPS Food, the International Panel of Experts on Food Systems. And we just came out with this report there, you can see, from, univer uni from uniformity to diversity. And um, it, uh, many of you pro probably know this report already, it just came out a few months ago. And we're trying to figure out, you know, okay, we know what to do, why it's not happening. And I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. So what is really needed? We need a fundamental shift. We said that before. Um, and the fundamental shift, really, it's not really scratching on the edges, like all the people think. Oh, now we're going to do a bit of sustainable intensification. Uh, no, that's not good enough. Paradigm change. A transition to really agricultural practices, exactly the way uh, uh, Michel was explaining before, in the three dimensions. Not only one, in the three dimensions, very important. Clearly when you say agroecology, some people say, ah, oh, now there are red flags, but you say organic agriculture, more red flags. So, you know, we, we need to figure out, okay, what is a language where we can bring people together? So people started to think about regenerative agriculture or regenerative systems, which is, I think, not so bad because it gives the action. What are we doing here? We have to regenerate our soils regenerate our biodiversity, regenerate our societies. I think that's, that's actually a, a, an approach, something where we could sort of use as a, as a chapeau. But always thinking about this multifunctionality, and when you do that, when you have this multifunctionality, you also add resilience uh, to the system. And the system, here we talk again, is, it is circular, it is not linear. And uh, so there's a number of papers out there you can go look at to you know sort of how to change the system, conventional to organic, for example. You can see how in many areas uh, we do better. But again, uh, organic is not necessarily sustainable, as we know. So we re really have to work hard uh, to go back to the basic principles of people who actually have described uh, organic agriculture just like they did for also uh, agroecology. So, we want an agriculture which actually is green, an agriculture which takes more carbon out of the air than actually is produced annually. And we can do that. There's a lot of calculation being done already, so that if we do it right, if we go global in agroecological practices, um, also on our pasture land, if we start to take this carbon out of the air, we may, we may actually get down to 1.5 degrees. And that's going to be discussed in, in, in Marrakesh uh, in the next few days, and I hope you'll do that. So we really, because agriculture, as I see it, and maybe other people here who have done some work on this, that's our salvation. But we need to change the way we eat. That's also part of the equation. And uh, not only just tell the farmer to do something different. And so there are different pathways. This is out of this IPES uh, food uh, uh, document. Now we can go from the large scale What's of the subsistence agriculture? That's not the way forward either, right? I mean, we, we need to modernize also. We need to mechanize appropriately so that people and young people actually want to be farmer. The land issue, it comes into the picture, women and youth, education. But I think we need to, to tend there to this, what is diversified agroecological uh, farming. And I think that's uh, where we, we need to go. So again, everybody will have to work toward this uh, direction. Is it feasible? People say, well, oh, you cannot do it. Again, I like to come back to this picture here. I'm just going to go right away to a mixed system. The ground should never be open. It doesn't have to be. 
we can grow legumes to produce our nitrogen. Those maize plants and sorghum and other plants we have tested in, in this system for over 20 years now in Africa, that system out yields the, the traditional by four or more times. And that's why I'm saying that in Africa, you can actually double the production almost overnight doing sustainable practices. And if you do that, you have plenty of food. We don't need all this to go to the conventional industrial model because those yields actually is odd yield most of what people try with, with fertilizer, for example, Agra and others in, in their maize fields. But here we use the plant's capacity to defend itself against the insects. Um, we, cl we clear the weeds out of the system, produce the nitrogen. So these are the type of integrated systems which can take care of themselves. And what do they do? They really will affix the carbon also and take the nitrogen. So again, so they are, you can do this in, with many different crops. The idea is behind this is, again, multi-crop, and not looking only for the, see, the criteria of kilogram per hectare has got to go. Because then you, you have kilogram, but what is it, starch? Or is it actually nutrients? These days it's mostly starch. That's why people are sick and obese and have diabetes. No, we want nutrition. Vandana Shiva says very well, more health per acre, not more kilograms per acre. Because we got plenty, I've sold before, double is much we need. So, you know, sometimes you wonder, why is this not happening? And a uh, study has been done, there's been probably in yours on around. All right, if conventional and, uh, is, is 100, in uh, organic, in developing countries, you can easily go double. And we've shown this, the evidence is there. Or here, a bit less, it's also okay. What's the problem? Because what we need to do also, we need to start to include in the price the externalities and that's the key to the transformation so if we start to pay for all the ill health the carbon we put up in the air the water we pollute and so the consumers comes in the picture right here because then they're gonna to have to make a decision do I buy the cheap food and pay a lot of taxes to clean up behind me or do I pay a little more and then I decide what's happening out there we don't socialize the costs. No, they have to, everyone has to carry its cost. And I think that if we do that in the food system, I think we will move. But still, for all what we know to do, it's not happening. We still have a problem. We have so much evidence. You know, the people on the other side, let's say now the biotech crowd say, okay, where is your evidence that you, know, you can do it, that you can do enough for all the 10 billion people? Oh, we have it long ago. But, the problem is that we have these lock-ins, and I'd like to uh, come to this. Uh, these are the, sort of the essence of this paper from uh, IPES Food, uh, where we have this concentration of power. It is huge, we know that, we heard some of it. Just look at the, at the, uh, the, the transformation of food. You know, how many companies? Ten companies worldwide basically cover all the brands of the stuff you can see in the supermarket. And a few are mega, the Nestle, PepsiCo and others. So concentration of power is a big problem. But the expectation of cheap food, I mentioned it already. Then we have an export orientation, big. Export rather than localizing food system, we said before. We need to localize. Go away from this globalization. It doesn't make sense. It creates a lot of problems. And actually the food you carry around the world and you keep in silos for two years like grain, that's not good anymore. We know that. There's even books written about it also. Um, the path dependency, green evolution, that's a path dependency. How are we going to get out of this thinking? Very difficult. Measure of success, kilogram per hectare rather than health, for example. And the short-term thinking, quick profit. So again, we, we need to get out of that. Agriculture doesn't work like maybe making bicycles, you know? Even that is, should be a bit more longer term. We don't, we, a farmer doesn't have quarterly reports, right? maybe annual, or even longer. And it's compartmentalized thinking. You know, we, we need to get out and start to think in systems. And I think that's very hard. So here, a few, if we can deal with these uh, blockages, I think we're gonna really uh, transform the system. And here, when I talk system, 
Uh, that's what I mean. These are systems which were, they are quantified. We have built this with farmers in Senegal, in Kenya, in Ethiopia. So they, are, they participate in understanding the system. This is part of the system. And if you think about where comes now genetic engineering, it's, it's, you cannot even see it on there because it's a dust particle. <laughs> so what are we thinking here? We're going to solve a problem by dealing with the dust particle of this now. No, we can't. So we have to go to our senses with this. And um, my conclusion really is, what's in your plate matters. And also who puts it into your plate. And um, right now, you can print it, as we know. Uh, last week, last week, they had the first meal by a special chef in New York, which was 100% genetically engineered products. OK, that was all over the press. Anyway, a week before there was another article saying that GMOs don't do anything, right? We all read that one too. So just to say, but if we had this, then we're gonna have that because we only need, need corn in the world because you can take it apart and put it together in your print cartridges and print whatever you want. Now, okay, if that's what people want, then that's the world we're gonna have. Thank you very much.